when I was in college, I got to take an astronomy course. And as part of that course, I got to go to the observatory at the college where I went at Ohio Wesleyan and look through the huge telescope. And I got to see the rings around Saturn. But the other thing I got to see was Halley's Comet. What I realized is that's probably the only time in my life I will get to see Halley's Comet. For any of you that were uh, not alive in 1986, you have your chance. It will be in, I believe it's 2061. I'll be 98 years old, so perhaps I won't see it again. But that experience of seeing those stars reminds me of the scripture that I want to share with you today. I'm so glad that you're joining us for this service of worship online. My name is Rachel Goni. I'm the senior pastor at Pell City First United Methodist, and I'm glad you've decided to join us in this way. I want to share with you some words from Psalm 8. It reads, Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them, yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. When I think about looking through that telescope and seeing those stars, or even when I walk out, uh, actually planet and comet, not stars, but when I walk out my door at night and I see the stars in the sky, I see the wonder of God's creation. While there are others that can look at the same thing and not see God at all. I look at creation and I see an argument for God's existence, while there are others that see God in nothing. They don't see God in that creative work. But why do I believe in God? What, what is it that I believe about God? When we use that word believe, we can mean a lot of different things. I mean, we could say, I believed the Eagles were going to beat the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, but that was something perhaps I just hoped for and didn't really believe in. Or there are things that we can believe in so intensely that we're willing to give our lives for it. When we hear the words that were set down by the Founding Fathers when they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, they were stating what they believed and they were willing to stake their lives on that. As Christians, we hold beliefs that shape us as individuals and that shape our community of faith. When we put those beliefs into a statement, we call it a creed. The United Methodist Church is not what we call a creedal church. A creedal church means you have to agree to all of the beliefs set out in a creed in order to join that church. Our church is uh, one where we profess our faith, but there's not a set creed that we say you have to believe. And yet, there are many creeds in our hymnal, in our book of worship, that we do share in saying. One of the oldest and most important is the Apostles' Creed. It's a historic statement of faith that contains essential beliefs that we hold with all Christians, with all of those who profess a Trinitarian God and Jesus as Lord. So during this season of Lent, we are going to look more closely at what those beliefs are by looking at the Apostles' Creed. And while we do that, we're going to think about why is it, it is important that we believe these things. How do they shape how we live our lives? For those of you that are watching this and are not participating in in-person worship, I especially want to say I invite you to follow along with these messages during Lent, but perhaps even uh, find the book by Adam Hamilton called Creed 
and join in reading that to give you a little bit more background as we go along. If you're interested in joining a study of that book, you can join us if you want to come in person on Wednesday nights, but we'll also be offering a class on Zoom on Sunday nights. So if you're interested in that, just put a comment in the comment section or um, contact the church office and we'll, we'll get you the link so you can join us for that study. I, I think that studying the Apostles' Creed and examining our beliefs during Lent is something that we can do to draw us closer to God. And that is exactly where the Creed starts. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. When I began talking today, I started talking about stars and planets and all of creation and how when I look at all of, of the pictures of space with all of the universe, I am convinced of the existence of God. For many Christians, that, um, that is the case that we see this wonderful creation and we know that God has created all that is. And yet at the same time, they, they sense that there might be this conflict between science and religion. Often that's because they are trying to read the Bible like a science textbook, which it is not. The Bible contains everything necessary for our faith and salvation, everything that we need to know about who our Creator is and who we are to be in relationship to our Creator God. But the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us every detail about how God created the world. Many Christians, though, want to read the Bible as a science book, and so they're unwilling to accept scientific theory and things like the theory of evolution because they see that somehow that might come in conflict about what they believe about God as their creator. While there are others who, because of scientific theory, are unwilling to accept that there might be a God who created this world, they believe more in natural selection, that things just sort of evolved in some random way to create this amazing world in which we live. But the chances of this world being created by a random natural selection are actually very thin. I read somewhere it's something like 1 to 40, wait, 10 to the 40,000th power, which I think is one with 40,000 zeros after it, if I'm, I'm not good at math. Another way of it's been described is it's like a gale force wind blew through a junkyard and after that wind passed, there's a Boeing 40, uh, 747 that's just randomly assembled itself after that wind passed through. The analogy that Adam Hamilton likes to use is about a cake. He says we can have you know, the ingredients, the cocoa, the sugar, the eggs, the flour, and we can set them randomly on the counter, but there's not much chance that all of that is gonna mix itself together and create a three-layer iced chocolate cake without someone who knows how to do it, how to create, how to mix and bake and ice that cake because they know what the cake should look like. In Psalm 8, which I read to you earlier, we're reminded that we are created by God, that we as human beings are part of God's good creation. In Psalm 90, which is a psalm attributed to Moses, we hear about the immense magnificence of God and how God is beyond time and space. Here's some, uh, some verses from Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight 
are like yesterday when it is past or like a watch in a night. That scripture reminds us with humility of our small existence in all of God's vast creation. But it also reminds us that we belong to God, even when God is much bigger than we are. And we are such small creatures. We are created by God and in God's image. In Genesis 1 and 2, we learn about God creating all that is and that we are created as the imagio dei, God's image in this world. And that tells us something about who God is. God is just not some force in the universe. God is a being, an entity, someone who has personal qualities just like we do, someone who has intelligence, emotion, reason, logic, and will. All those things that we know in ourselves, we know are in the image of God, and therefore this tells us who God is because we are created in God's image. And it also tells us something about our relationship to God. We know from Jesus that God is our Father. Just as Jesus called God Father, God is our Father, the one who we are in relationship to as the one who cares for us, as a father cares for his children. And when I, we say that we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of the universe, it's not just about, about seeing God in the stars and in the creation around us, or understanding ourselves being made in God's image. It is also about this relationship that we understand ourselves in with God. It is about how we experience God in prayer, in reflection, in times of worship, in times when we're reading our Bibles, when we know the Spirit as close as our own breath. In all those places when I feel the Spirit moving, I know myself as a beloved child of God. And because of that, I know that I am called to live my life differently because of who God is and who God has created me and each one of us who is a beloved child, who God has created us to be. When we profess our faith in God, when we say that God is the Father Almighty, the creator of the world, our lives are meant to look different because of that. They should look different because of what we profess as our beliefs. As we continue through this season of Lent and look more deeply at the Apostles' Creed, we will continue to return to that idea of why what we believe matters and who we become because of what we believe. But today I'd like to um, invite you to join me in saying the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the, Vir by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you pray with me? Creator God, we are stunned by the breadth and depth of your creation. We acknowledge both our responsibility for caring for it and our insignificance in the face of its magnificence. We give thanks too that in the vastness of the cosmos, 
that you know each one of us and love each of us as a father loves his child, as a mother nourishes and cherishes her infant. Lord, stir us to respond to your great creation with awe and gratitude and care. Grant us wisdom as we seek to find our place in your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace to love and serve in all you do. thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise the glories of my God and King the triumphs of His grace if eloquence I could display and every language sing a thousand words could never say the praise I have for thee saints from every age with thousands times ten thousand strong will praise his holy name hallelujah to face I see the splendid beauty of the sun the one who died for me 